Good morning, everybody. My name is Jeremy Murrah, and I'm here to talk about, I need a deep breath to say all that, building commandlets for REST API with PowerShell classes, Azure-based integration tests, and continuous deployment. They gave me a double-linked session so I'd have time to read all of that. So, um, and the reason there's so much up there is rather than do you know, a deep dive on a single topic, like Kirk's debugging session, that, uh, or some of the other ones, I wanted to kind of cover an end-to-end -end scenario, right? Like a project you might do, where say you start with this, this super important REST API that you need to wrangle. Um, you know, that's, that's not swagger based because you can just let that write its own code. But say you've got this API, uh, they didn't write their own PowerShell commandlets for whatever reason. They think it's a fad and we're all going to switch back to Perl or something. So, but you've got this API and you're going to go through the process of turning that into something that's a lot more user friendly. But then you're going to keep going and ideally, ultimately end up with something that you publish out on the PowerShell gallery so all the rest of us can use it and not have to go through this process. So, I kind of wanted to touch on all, the, all the, the pieces of that that you might see. So we're going to go through all of that. Um, this was the, the specifics for my, my demo code and my project was something I did with, it's, it's a uh, device called an Infoblox, uh, that's the company name, I forget the appliance. I don't know if anybody's familiar, it's a DNS, DHCP, IPAM kind of appliance, so yeah. We have that, they have an API, they're sticking to their Perl API though, they're sticking to their gun, so. But they have a REST API and, a, uh, and all that. So I kind of went through a process of um, of writing commandlets for that and just kind of kept going and it's out on the gallery and, it, and, and that was super useful. Um, so some of the stuff is specific to that but I'm gonna try to separate out the, the specifics of that implementation and what's, and point out, you know, what's generic to this, this kind of structure as a concept that you can reuse for something else. Um, anyway, so that's the idea, so let's do that. So um, what a REST API is, well it's a lot of things but at its, you know, its real basic core, it's a uh, URL representation of an object or multiple objects, and then you've got your standard methods that you can uh, perform against it, right? Your HTTP calls, your put, your get, your post, your delete, um, you know, pretty basic, basic stuff there. And there's some extras, some you know, functions and extra, but that's the general idea. Classes um, are a similar kind of thing. You've got a representation of an object with defined properties, and then these static methods, and so, in looking at this, uh, there was, seemed to be, you know, a fair bit of carryover, kind of a one-to-one -one mapping. So that's kind of the, the genesis of where this idea came from. Um, that and also PowerShell 5 had just come out and I was looking for an excuse to play with classes because why not, right? So uh, this kind of started in there. Um, but why classes? You can do this with helper functions or you can just do this, you've always been able to do this with standard PowerShell or just do an invoke rest method after all. Um, well, so, like I mentioned, I, part of why I started was really just to kind of play with it, right? And, and try something new that hadn't been done before as far as I knew. What I found was a couple of really interesting um, uh, sort of benefits to it when I started playing with it. What, you know, we talk about in, in PowerShell that the thing is always have a function that does one thing, right? And that's for readability and that's for ease of use, ease of coding later when you're trying to figure out what you did. Um, and so that's a, that's a common model and that's really helpful and when I started looking at uh, doing it with a REST API and putting a commandlet, in a way, even on like a git, you know, git some data of this particular type, you're kind of doing two things. You can think about it, you've got, you've got your, uh, your, your invoke REST method and you've got to build that URI string or that payload and do all this work to parse that data and then send it off and then get your return. Hopefully instead of a 400 you get an actual return and then you've got to do something to maybe parse that output or do some logic around it. So that's all the API interaction code. But then you've got your, your parameters and your input that you're taking from the users and any output you send them and maybe some extra validation, all that user-friendly, gooey, touchy-feely stuff. So in a way, those are kind of two separate things. Um, and you can do it all together. It's, it's not terribly complicated, but what, what I found is if you, you set your class definitions as kind of that, that API inter interface. So you're gonna make a, 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 an object and that object is gonna be that direct representation of your API object. And all the work that you do when you are connecting uh, to that API and that representation, that's all gonna happen in your class structure. That's a whole separate file or a whole separate bit of code. Um, and that frees you up in your commandlet to focus on all your touchy-feely user stuff, right? Your parameter validation, maybe some extra logic, error handling. Uh, APIs love to give you that 400, right? You do any little thing wrong and you get a 400. And there's an error buried in there somewhere um, now that I'm an expert on, I'm a debugging ninja from Kirk's class, I might figure all that out, but uh, it, it's, it's difficult. So maybe you do some extra, extra logic ahead of time. And 
because you've separated out some of the API work, it's, and we'll see this in, in some of the code, it, it makes it really simple to sort of expand upon that because you've got that separation. So I thought that was pretty interesting when I started going through this. Uh, another thing that's really cool is um, kind of what you get for free with PowerShell. You know, PowerShell loves objects, we all know that. And when you, when you do objects in and objects out, you get a lot of stuff for free, right? You get all that pipelining and you get stuff like format table and format list, that all comes for free. Well, PowerShell really likes uh, typed objects, objects of a certain type. When you, can, when you can tell it just something other than a PS object, you get even more for free. So uh, on the left is something you might do. Let's say you have a, uh, you've got a commandlet that you're um, gonna do a set, right? So you've, you've already written the commandlet that retrieves some data from your API or from some other source. You want to, because this is PowerShell, you wanna pipe that directly over to your set command. And what you want to do, without any, you know, too much, too much fuss, but if you're passing in a PS object, you want to have a, a, make some assumptions about that input, right? You need to know that, okay, I'm, I'm expecting that this PS object is coming from my git command, but I can't guarantee it, right? A PS object can come from anywhere. You can craft it by hand, or it can come from import CSV. You don't really know. So maybe I'm going to use uh, the value from pipeline by property name, and I'll say, okay, I expect that my input object should have a, uh, a name property, and maybe I've got a, a numerical value and a string value, so I'm going to define all these because I'm going I'm to need that data anyway, but also I want to make sure that my object is the right kind of object. All right, so maybe it passes all these checks, and I didn't put all this, this would have been a horrible slide, but maybe it passes those checks, um, but you still want to understand that this is a valid representation of a live object on your API endpoint, right? It may be that kind of PS object, but that could have been something somebody dumped out to a spreadsheet a month ago, and now they're telling you, hey, go clean this up. So you can't assume that it's valid, so you'd probably have to go after all of this, and maybe a begin block, or well, I guess it'd be your process block, is go out to your endpoint and do a retrieval anyway, and validate that, that object that you're gonna act upon is really out there, and it really has all this data. Especially before you're doing something like a remove. You really wanna make sure you're removing the right thing. Um, so you've got to do a lot of work in your commandlet just to validate your data. Well, here on the right, if, we're, if we have our API object defined from a class structure, we've got a very specific object type. And so we can specify that on our single input object. We take the entire object in, it's of this certain type, it will only pass our parameter validation if it is of that type. And what that tells us, or gives us a, an assumption, right? we wrote that class definition so we know all the properties. It has to be of that type. Um, we know that, or we can have a, a, a good enough assumption that it is a valid object on our API endpoint because there's a fewer places that that class can come from, right? It's gonna come from our class definition that did that call and retrieved that object. So, and this is not, you know, a security boundary by any means. You know, somebody can just make a class themselves and, and if it was an intent to be malicious, that is still gonna happen, but that's not the point of parameter validation. This is to save you from causing horrible, uh, horrible uh, uh, harm when you're passing in the wrong kind of thing. So you get a lot of that kind of stuff for free because you've defined the object of that type. So you can turn a whole lot of code into one, one line in a way and, and that, again, frees you up to do more of the, more of the user, user friendly GUI stuff. So. And then of course, because this is PowerShell and we all like having fun, why not? You never know if something is a, a, a fit for the job until you try it. Uh, that's my, my five-year-old doing some experimentation of his own. They, they said we well, can't use copyrighted images, but I figure I own the copyright on that, both the picture and the, and the, uh, the subject, so. Experimentation, that's why we're here, right? So, all right, that's enough slides for a little while. Oh, that next is a good one, yeah. All right, so let's switch over and, oh wait, just kidding, there we go. Let's look at some of this here. Uh, let's see, where am I at? I should have loaded all this up ahead of time. There we go. So, I'll kind of walk through this here. Let me hide this. Is this size okay? You guys can see that in the back? Okay. It's horrible up here. These tiny screens killing me. Okay. But, uh, so this is uh, your kind of your basic, what a class is, it, it might look like. Um, like I mentioned, I'm doing my use case here is this DNS appliance. So I picked the uh, DNS A record, uh, uh, everyone's favorite granddad, the DNS A record, uh, to represent with this, with this class. And so you know you you have your 
the kind of properties you'd expect on a, uh, an A record, right? A name and an IP address. Um, we get some extra stuff and some of the, again, this is all the API specific stuff, your properties, and that's gonna be defined by your API and hopefully your documentation is really good because that's what makes or breaks an API. So they have defined this object as having these properties and I'm, I'm using those here. So we've got a comment to something the Infolux gives us this ability to put a comment. Uh, I've got this underscore ref is really interesting. That's a unique, a unique identifier for every kind of object that the API endpoint gives us. So every A record, every C name, every address reservation has a different one of those. Um, and I found out you can actually start a variable with an underscore, so that's pretty interesting. It makes for some funny looking code, especially when it's a property and you've got something dot underscore, but it totally works, so <laughs> that was kind of interesting. So anyway, you've got all your properties that would define whatever the object is gonna be. Um, and you've got your uh, constructors here, which is really just like a, 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 the new method, right? This is how you, when you are um, instantiating an object from this class, these are the properties that you need to build the object. And you can do some really complex things here or not. Typically I just pass in the, the, the properties that are defined at the top, say you must fill in all of these in order to create an object of this type. Um, where this gets interesting um, is in the methods, right? Just uh, take a sip here. So we talked about, uh, you know, an API has your, your, your CRUD, your create, your read, your update, and delete. Those are primarily your four methods of interacting with an API. So we're just going to um, represent uh, or create a method, a one-to-one -one method for each of those. All right, so I'm gonna walk through these a little bit and I'm trying not to be too tedious with all the code, but so a method, uh, I like to think of a method for me anyway as kind of a little mini function within my class, right? So I've got, um, I've got all these properties here and these are not, they're, they're similar to the properties that we define in the class, but they're not really related. These are the properties or the inputs that I need in order to execute this method and that's it. The fact that they are, are similar to the class makes sense because I'm creating a DNSA record, but I could have a method that took completely different inputs depending upon what I want to do. So it's a little bit of a separation there, but thinking about it like a little function inside your class is kind of how I like to think about it. So a couple of things here, uh, we look at line 14, right? This is the beginning of that. So this is a static method, meaning I don't already have to have an object defined in order to run this method, which makes sense for a create. I'm not gonna create an object upon an object that I've already created. I'm gonna create an object out of nothing. Um, so the, it, we've got a designation here, IBDNS A record, that's the name of my class. So what I'm telling it here is the output from this, this method is gonna do output an object of this type. And that's super important for the parameter validation stuff when we get to the commandlets, what I'm showing there. It's important, the object output type is really important. Um, you could have, you know, system.object and you wouldn't lose any of the benefits, but that would work. Uh, and then the name is whatever you want to call it. It doesn't have to match up with any sort of API verb or anything like that. It's just whatever you want to call it. Um, so the, the general uh, flow of the body of these, of all the methods are pretty similar. The, the idea here is you're taking these inputs and doing whatever processing you need to build your payload. And that payload is your URI string which is that, you know, the URL, the reference to where that object is on your API endpoint, and then optionally um, some sort of payload, some sort of body, right, a JSON or hash table, um, you know, that's it, optional because in case of, and we'll see with, with like a retrieval or a get or query, you can do all of that on a string, you don't need a payload at all. Um, for something like a, like a put or a post in this case, it's, it's good to have. So that's, and that's, that's kind of the pattern for all of them is, that's, and this is all the work you would do if you were doing this, just doing this in PowerShell without classes, is you would just go through the logic of building that, that data set, and then you just call invoke REST method to submit it. Hopefully it, it passes and you get, you get a return object, and then doing some work upon that return object, depending on what that return object is. So um, in, in this case, for you know, different, uh, on my API endpoint, different object, or different methods return different, uh, different results. So in the case of a create, it doesn't actually return to me back my entire record. It returns back that unique reference identifier that I mentioned. This is this big long string. It's like a GUID without dashes basically. So it returns that. Um, now what I, what I need to do, and, and Snover's talked about this a couple times, where the return, uh, the way you output things from classes is, is very different from, from standard PowerShell, right? Standard PowerShell, you just kind of have to throw it out there to the universe and it'll eventually plinko down and it'll end up out on your screen or in whatever your output is. You don't do that with classes. 
you, you have to define one and only one and not less than one uh, output objects. And everything has to return an ob a, a single return. So you've got to define that, and that's, uh, that, that takes some getting used to. But it's nice because you don't accidentally end up with extra output. You know, if you're ever trying to use return and then you have some, something that you didn't catch and it spits it out to the screen, you end up with some garbage output. So you can't do that with classes, but you do have to be aware. So what I'm doing, um, what I've chosen to do here, and this is just a design choice, what you ultimately need to do because of the output we define is you need to craft uh, an object of this type, IV DNSA record, through some method, craft that object, and then, and then that's your return. So what I could have done here is done the uh, colon colon new and called the constructor, because I've got all the, all the information I need, right? I've got all these properties that came in to my method. I could just build that up. What I've chosen to do instead is call my next method, the get method, just kind of as an extra check. Um, so I'm going to send that information that it gave me. In, my, in that case, it's that unique reference identifier. I'm going to submit that back to my endpoint and say, hey, I know you just created this, but can you give it to me again? And when I get that back, the way it's defined, the, the get method on my API endpoint is defined is to return the entire object. So it's kind of an extra validation for all my properties. If it decided to change the name just slightly or, or on its end or change my, say, my IP address or something, I, I get all that by just doing that query again. So it's an extra check and it doesn't cost me anything. And then this is that also that important part. If I don't get any return back, if it fails or whatever, I have to return something. In this case, I'm just going to return dollar no. But you have to have a return statement for every endpoint. There's this nice, useful error that'll say something. IntelliSense will pop it up, and it'll tell you something like all code paths don't return an output or something like that. Um, so that's super important. So, so that's kind of the create method, and, and I'm going to walk through uh, git next because I want to point out how I've, how I've used that. And, and with git, um, you have a, actually have a couple different options. Let's do this little expansion here. So we actually have two git methods we're going to go through because there's two different ways you might do stuff. So this is, what, this is the git method that I just I called from create, right? I've got my unique reference identifier, and I'm just going to pass that back to my endpoint. And I've got some extra properties here, and I'm going to talk about Authentication very briefly, because that's very API specific and how you want to handle that. Um, but I've got these, these this, uh, I've got my session, which is the web session that I catch from invoke rest method. Um, and that's a nice and easy way of doing authentication. If your API lets you get away with that, then you're in, you're in good shape, because that's a nice, there are harder ways to do authentication. So I'm passing my session in, um, and I've chosen to, and this is a design choice. It, it's arguable where you want to put that. But what I've chosen to do is rather than do any authentication in my methods and my classes, is handle the authentication and creating of that session outside of that and then just pass it in. So, I don't, I, you know, six of one, half a dozen. It saves me, it saves me a little typing doing it once um, ahead of time. And when I get into the command lines, I'll kind of show you the choices I made there. But anyway, so I'm going to pass in that session is required, obviously, to have a connection, um, and then there's some information I use to build my URI string, that reference identifier. And you can see here, I don't have a hash table or a body of any type. This is an option with uh, certain methods you can just query, and again, this is up to your API, but I can just do a, do a single uh, URI string to get my return. And in the same way as the create method, I call invoke rest method, get my return object back. But in this case, I'm using that constructor, that new method, to craft my object. Um, and I, I have to do some formatting on the IP address, but using all my return, my return object properties, I'm, I just build that object and then I return it or return null. Same, same kind of rules apply. I've got to return something. Um, so, and that's great for, that's great for when you have that unique reference identifier. But most of the time you don't, right? You're, especially if your API didn't have that. Um, if you are trying to get, say, every DNSA record for this one server or every one that has this IP address because maybe I've got some duplicates, right? You're going to need to do a query, which is going to be your common way of interacting with an API. So this would not work at all for that, right? I'm not retrieving, I'm not have any of the, of the inputs that I need coming into my method at all to even do a query. So I'm going to make an entirely new method, um, what they call an overload is what the developers like to call it. So which ultimately is just another method with the same name. And so these are, I'm doing the same thing, I'm doing a get, but I'm doing it in a completely different way with a completely different set of inputs. So rather than try to just have one big one and do if this then that, I'll just make a whole separate one. So 
it flows more logically because it's a different kind of operation. It starts out similarly. Uh, you see this is also a static method because again, we don't already have an object, we're getting a new one. Now there's a, a little thing here with the output. Um, notice it's IBD and SA record, but it's that collection notation, that extra set of braces. And that's important because in this case we are returning uh, potentially more than one object, right? Because you do a query, you're, with that unique reference string you're only getting that one record. With this you're potentially getting more than one. And because of the way classes handle outputs, and because of the way we want to be able to do parameter validation when we're wrapping commandlets around this, that's super important to have. It's got some weird little quirks, and I'll, I'll show you that in the demo. It gets, it gets kind of weird, but that's, that's important to have. And again, it's, it's a git method. Um, so it's the same kind of thing. And you'll see our, our properties, we've got a whole lot more coming in, right? But we've got our name and our IP address and comment and zone and all. These are all things that we could potentially be querying upon. And that's defined, again, by our API documentation. They have said that we can search by all these things. Um, if they didn't allow us to search by something, we'd just leave it out. So there's a little more work going on here, but it's the same kind of thing. We're taking all those inputs and just building up, uh, in this case, just building up a very long URL, adding each, each property. Um, now the thing with, uh, interesting thing with classes and, and why we have this laid out the way it is, is none of these input properties are optional. You have to put something in there. You know, with, with uh, some of the .NET stuff, you can kind of do, get away with like comma, 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 and skip a bunch of stuff. Uh, you can't really do that here with PowerShell classes. At least you couldn't when I wrote all this. So you've got to pass in, if you, if you don't want any of those values, you pass in a dollar null. So instead of comma, 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 you've got comma, dollar null, comma, dollar null, comma, dollar null. And that's ugly. But since we're wrapping commandments around this, we don't have to worry about that. Users aren't going to see that. But I have, to, I have to assume that some of these are going to be null. So I just do a bunch of ifs. And if the value is in there, I'm going to append it. And that's it's building the, uh, the structure of that URL. Yes? Maybe I'm missing something. You can't do default value? Um, you know, I don't remember. I, I don't know that you could when it, when it first came out. Yeah, yeah that, that might have changed. But yeah. Now I could, do, um, I could do more overloads if I wanted to make some other assumptions. You know, I could skip that up. But again, since I'm not putting this in front of users, I don't, you know, I'm not trying to make it pretty no, in this I case. So. Yeah. Seems like that would be, if that was supported, that would be the usual way to do it. Yeah, so. potentially so. Yes? Uh, not in any of the, the, the types that I've used, no. Yeah, I don't believe. And I think with maybe with some of the enums, it might get a little weird. I wasn't able to, I didn't really do anything with that. So yeah, in most cases, dollar null can turn into whatever it needs to turn into. Um, okay, so same kind of stuff. We're just building our URI string, and we're going to call invoke rest method and catch our return. Oh, one, one thing I've got in here which is, has been proven really useful is uh, this line 108, this write verbose. So what I'm doing is I'm writing out the URI string that I built before I call it. It's really helpful for, for debugging. Um, interesting thing about write verbose, it works, but you can't call, there's no dash verbose switch on a class, right? But we're putting, again, we're putting commandlets in front of this, so when you call your commandlet with dash verbose or set your verbose preference, that carries through to the classes that it calls. So, so that works, and that's a handy, handy sort of thing. Um, now our output gets a little different on this one because, again, we are returning potentially multiple objects, uh, or, or multiple objects are coming back from our API endpoint. But we still can only do a single return. We can't return this output and then return the next one. You know, we don't get that pipelining operation that we're used to in PowerShell. So we've got to do the, you know, build an empty array and then loop through, create an object for each of our return fields, and we're just doing the same new constructor that we did before, and then concatenating them all together into an array of objects and then doing the return. And because, again, that ties in with our, um, with our output type, that collection of DNSA records, because it's not a single DNSA record, and it won't let you, you build this array and try to return it as a single DNSA record, that's no, no good. I won't let you do that. So, but that collection of DNSA records is, is what sort of represents that array notation. Um, so that's why that's important. Um, so that's, that's those two. Um, through here, the set method. So those are our static methods, right? And those are our two methods of sort of creating an object based upon those, uh, those API endpoints. Now our set method is gonna be, obviously, what we're gonna use to change a value on an existing 
record. And because it has to be an existing record, this is not going to be a static method. This is going to be a, a method that exists on an instantiated object. So it's a little different. I've got, instead of static, I've got this keyword hidden. And that's handy for, well, that does what it says. It hides it a little bit from view. Um, and I'll show you this in the demo, but basically what that does is that, that hides it from, from git member and some of the IntelliSense stuff, not all of it. The idea is, because in our, in our case, we are putting commandlets in front of the user. We don't really want the user mucking around with an object.set, an object.delete, right? We, we want them using our commandlets. That's the whole point. So hide, you put a hidden there, and it just doesn't show up in, in git member. You can still force it, and you can find it some other ways, and you can still call it, but it gives it a, a little bit of uh, hidden, and that'd be nice if that were a little more strict in, in not letting you do that, but anyway. Our output type here is void, meaning we're not going to actually output any object. Um, in our case, we're, we're kind of, and, th and again, this is a design choice. Um, I've decided, well, the way I'm doing it is, is the idea of the set being, I'm going to make a change, and if it works, I've made the change. If it doesn't work, I'm going to you know, throw all kinds of errors or whatever, but I don't necessarily need to return the object. Um, in the commandlets, I add some switches. You, know, you can add like the pass-through and say, well, if I say pass-through, then spit me out the object. And if I don't, just do it and, and don't tell me about it. Um, without handle that in the commandlet, because again, that's a user choice sort of thing. So I'm going to do a set, and I'm just going to not, not return any outputs. Um, same kind of idea, right? I've got properties, and these are the inputs that I need in order to make a change to a record. So there's fewer here. Notice there's no name and no, there's no, uh, well, there's no name on this one. Because this is a uh, non, not a static method, I have the record and all the properties on the record that I can just reference with the dollar this keyword. So I, I can use all of this dot name to reference the name. I don't need to pass it in. The things that I'm passing in are the fields that the API allows me to change. So I'm going to pass in the IP address is going to be not, not the dollar this dot IP address. It's the IP address I want to change it to if I choose to change it. Um, and same kind of thing once I, once I get my inputs is, is, and this is, you know, it gets kind of repetitive, which is nice when you're writing a lot of this because you can do a lot of copy and pasting. But same kind of thing. I build my URI string. I build my hash table for, uh, for input. It can be JSON or it can be a, a hash table, either one. And then I call my invoke rest method. Now here, um, because I already have an object, and again, because I'm not outputting anything, I simply need to change the properties on my existing object to um, based upon my return. So in the particular case of my device, that unique uh, immutable reference identifier isn't, turns out to not be all that immutable. So that can actually change from a, if you make a significant enough modification. So I am going to re -up, I'm going to update that value. So I reference the dollar this here, and you see I change my, change my reference string. It might not actually change, but I'm going to, I'm going to uh, reference my return. Was, the return was that reference string, and that's, that's what your API, your, again, your API defines all this, right? In the case of the get, it returned an entire object back. In the case of the create and the set, actually, and then the delete, it returns just that reference string. So I can use that reference string and then just uh, make my modifications to my existing record. I don't have to add it and put anything because it's making changes to my instantiated object in memory. Um, so that's that. The delete method I saved for last because it's the simplest out of all of them. That's it. You simply reference the, uh, the URI of the reference string. That's how you reference the URI of an object and just call the, um, the delete method of invoke rest method in your delete method defined in your class. Um, and that, that's really all there is to the delete method. That, that's pretty simple. And most, most APIs should behave that way. Um, so that's, that's kind of it for, for your really, your basic class definition. Um, we can, we're gonna add a little flair to that here in a second. Any questions on any of that particular stuff? Okay. So, so that's great. Um, but maybe you want to add a little, little flair, you know, part of this was uh, experimentation and, and all that. So let's, let's look at an inheritance, right? We can uh, maybe save ourselves a little bit of typing. So I mentioned that this unique reference identifier is common among all objects in my API. Uh, the delete method, it turns out, is also exactly the same for every object, because all I'm doing is referencing that unique reference identifier and calling a delete method. So because those are the same, and I know that they're exactly the same across everything, I can pull those out, put those in a root class, define a class that just has that one property and that one method, and then have all my other classes inherit from that. So my DNSA record can inherit from 
that root class. My CNAME record can inherit from that root class. I no longer have to then define reference string and delete method, which is it's like five lines of code, but you get the idea. So take a look at what that looks like. Uh, where'd I put that? That was in here. Yeah, so I'm gonna define a class called IB reference object. And you know, of course the IB is my prefix that I've used to make sure I don't step on anything else, and that's a probably a good idea. I've read somewhere that's a good idea to do. Um, so I'm gonna define a class that again is, is not gonna have much in it. I'm gonna have a single property, my reference string, and I'm gonna have a single method. Um, and, that, and that method is just what we saw. It's exactly, exactly what we saw. We're just using the, dollar, the underscore ref to and then end the delete method. So, and then you've got some constructors. Every class needs constructors. Um, nothing real, real complicated there. But where that gets cool is, uh, you know, that saves me, um, that saves me my typing, right? So I can, uh, I can then have a DNSA record that looks like this. So that notation at the top tells it to inherit from IB reference object. And you'll notice I no longer have, in my property list, I no longer have underscore ref. And in my methods, I no longer have delete. And that's great. That saves me a few lines of code. Um, but hey, I've got, I've got this new class, right? This IB reference class. Let's do some stuff to it uh, to kind of spice this up a little bit. So again, here's a, here's a new reference object with some extra flair in it. We've got our underscore ref property, our hidden method. And I thought, well, let's, let's do some extra work. Um, let's override or let's replace some other methods. So we've got this two string method, which you've probably seen on objects all over the place. Uh, that comes down, I think, from system.object is where that inherits down, or somewhere up there, you get this two string method. And a lot of times that doesn't work so well on objects. If you've ever tried to out, uh, dump out a big array of objects or a list out to um, uh, Excel or something, or also a CSV, you pull it up, and that column that you expected to have some information just has PS object, PS object, PS object all the way down, because that property was not a string or whatever, it was itself an object that didn't reference well. So, and that's because that, what that's doing basically is, is trying to convert it to a string and not doing a very good job of it. So we're going to replace the two string method. And so instead of getting system, or in our case, IB DNS A record, we've decided to say that, you know, that, that unique reference identifier is a great textual representation of our object. It's got, and I'll show you, in the, I don't think I've actually shown you what it looks like, but it's got everything you need to understand what that object is. So in our case, that's a great, that's a better, string version of our API. So we're gonna add this in here. And because that's in here, every object that we inherit, that in, inherits from this base class is going to have a better two string property. That's really handy. So, okay, so enough of me uh, rattling off, uh, showing off my laundry here. Let's flip over to my demo and let's run some of these and see what this interaction looks like. And let's see, uh, my stuff might have timed out a little bit. So I'm gonna load up. Oh, I did this out of order. <laughs> I was gonna demo as I went. Okay, so we're gonna do all the demos at once here. Um, so I'm gonna load, load up our first demo. This is the, the without inheritance uh, sort of thing. I've got this, uh, this, this web session here. So I'll talk a little bit uh, about this real quick. Again, this is, this is separate from the, the sort of the class discussion, but it's important for APIs. You've gotta handle your authentication in some way. And that's very much up to the API and how they, well, like everything, is up to the API and how they implement that. Um, in this case, I consider myself pretty lucky. I'm able to use the uh, credential parameter and the web, uh, or the session variable parameter of invoke rest method. And that just saves that session and you pass, pass a standard credential object. Uh, there's some APIs that you have to craft an authentication header and pass that every time. That looks really hard. I haven't had to do that yet. So if you do, my apologies um, or my condolences. So, but again, that's, that's kind of a separate, how you handle that is kind of a little bit separate from this discussion. It's, the assumption is that you will have done that at some point before you start mucking with objects. Now what I've, I've decided to do, and this is just purely a design choice, is, is take my, my session variable, um, and, and likewise this, this grid master, which is, is in my ver API version, which is used for building that URI string, and I've decided to uh, scope those out to script scope, which scoping gets really weird, but when you script so scope something from within a module, it is available to the rest of the commands in that module, but not out to the user. In this demo case, I've script scoped it out to my session so we can take a look at it. Um, so what that looks like is, is just your standard uh, web session variable. If you used invoke 
web request or invoke rest method, you get this standard session. It's got your credentials and your cookies and all that sort of stuff. And these other ones are just strings. Um, but those are, these are important for, um, oh, that one didn't go. But this, is just, this, this is a URL for my, my endpoint, which is a live endpoint out in Azure. So that's kind of nice. Um, and again, that's, I just mentioned that there because I'm, I'm going to be, I've handled that separately so that I can pass that into my classes. I didn't want to make design, to cho design choices about authentication within my class. I kind of wanted that to be separate. It's up to you how you want to do that. So let's take a look at what these classes look like. Again, this would have been, had I done this in the right order, this would have been before we talk about inheritance. So we see our get methods, we've got our two, and this looks similar to what we saw in the definition. I see our first one gets by reference string and it just outputs a single record, and our second one is the query um, method, and it returns that, that uh, collection object. So let's run through these, let's do this, and we'll find out if Wi-Fi is working here, and we'll get an object back. And I'm gonna try to F8 my way out through all these demos so you don't have to watch me type. We'll see how that works. Um, so let's look at what a record looks like, right? And we're just using the classes here, and notice, that, notice that, that, that thing I've had to type there, right? So I pass in the parameters, and on the right order, and then a whole bunch of stuff I didn't want to search by, I pass in dollar null. It's not the prettiest thing, but again, we're going to hide that. So. And I, so just looking at the classes, let's look at a record here. Let's stretch that up a little bit. So it, it, it looks like your standard object, is, which is, it is. Nothing, nothing real fancy there. It returns all our, our objects. And that's, so that's our unique reference string, right? It's got this big, long, uh, unique value, two to the power of a million or whatever it is. It's got our, uh, our entry name there. So that's... That's what we chose to use as our textual representation of a record, so it's super useful, better than bracket object name. Uh, we look at a get member, we will see this kind of what we're expecting to see. Um, you've got your methods and properties. You see the type name is IBDNSA record. Um, and you can do that, you know, if you had a PS object, you can add type names and all that kind of stuff. But because we define this natively, relatively natively, we have that there. Um, you'll see we've got all the properties that we had defined on the object, it's nothing new. We've got a, a two string get type, all your standard inherited down methods. We've got our delete method here. Because if you know, if you if you caught that when I was defining that, I put uh, hidden on set. I didn't put hidden on delete. And I wanted to illustrate that. So this is what that hidden keyword does basically, right? So if somebody's mucking around with their, out, their output and saying, oh, what do I have here? Oh, delete, that looks like fun. So it would at least hide that. And again, if they did record.delete and they knew what to type, they could still fill that in and, and cause trouble. But it hides it from uh, the casual, keeps, uh, keeps honest people honest, right? So now that we have a record, let's look at our uh, non-static methods that we can look at. And I want to point these out because this is where things get a little weird. So record.set. Well, that's not our set method at all. That's, that's not at all what we defined. That's some garbage. So what that is actually telling us, this is part of that weird thing with it being a collection. That's the set method on a DNS A record collection. What I need to reference is the set method and the delete method on an object. So I'm going to, I'm going to look at the first object in a single item array or collection. And that is the set method that I expect. I don't know why that is. I'm sure there's someone here who can explain that. This is like some complicated developer stuff. So if you know the answer to this, come, come see me. I'd, I'd love to get more info. But that's something also to be aware of. Uh, but again, we're going to hide all that from the user so they don't have to worry about that. Um, and then delete is the uh, same kind of thing. So I'm going to fast forward now. This is where I would talk about inheritance. We're going to see some of the uh, inheritance benefits in action. So let me load up those here. So let's go get a new record. We're going to do a couple things here. We're going to get... Another record, we're actually going to get the same uh, record for server one. The same record I got for dollar record. I should have called that record one. That would have made more sense. Anyway, so I'm going to get that record. But again, this is the new class definition that I just created with inheritance. So it's the shiny polished one, right? And then I'm also going to get the same element um, using my, that's my new uh, reference object, my base class. And you'll see I'm, what I'm passing in is that record two underscore ref. So I'm getting the exact same item from my APA endpoint, but I'm defining it as two different kinds of classes. So you can see, we can see what that looks like here. So I'm going to load this up, load that up. So let's look at ref record. And you see it only had, if you remember, it only had the one property, underscore ref. And that's, so that's all we see. Pipe that to get member. 
same kind of thing. I don't have any methods. I fix that delete, put a hidden back on delete. Um, so you don't see that, but I've got an underscore ref there and that's it. My record two, which is the same object on the endpoint, is of the DNS record class. So it has all the properties that we expect to see and that's all on how we defined it. Um, if we look at record to get member, um, so we've got all that. I, I fixed that delete, hidden, put the hidden back on the delete, so that's gone from there. And that looks just like record one. Now, we added that to string, right? So let's take a look at what that looks like. Again, for this method, we have to reference the, uh, the element within the ar array. So if we look at that, you see now we get, or well, I'll show you in a minute. We get the, uh, that reference string as our output, and that's a much better visual representation of a, of a, of a string object. So um, I, I have this here, so I want to point out that, that that is not a recursive sort of thing, or uh, retroactive, I guess. Um, record two was, def was instantiated after we modified our class definition. A record was, is still that object we instantiated before we added inheritance. So if we look at it, it's two string, it does not benefit from that new and we get the old IBDNSA record. And so that's, that's an important, important thing is it doesn't, it, it's not some sort of global all encompassing definition. What you define and when you instantiate that object, it is an object in memory like any other variable and it, properties and methods are defined on it at the time that you create that class definition or the time that you instantiate it. Um, okay, so now I'm back in the order that I was initially intending on going through. So let's look at what commandlets will look like wrapped around this, right? We saw there's some with that bracket zero bracket and the get method. Some of those are not the, the prettiest user facing things. Um, if you're like me, and you're the PowerShell guy in your office, you have a hard enough time getting people to run commandlets, much less getting them to run. No, you just run the, the class and make sure you put seven nulls, and then you put the one and you'll be fine. And that, that's never gonna work, right? That's where I work, that would never work. People just kinda go cross-eyed and probably pass out. So let's look at what we can do with commandlets. Um, so I'm gonna walk through these real quick and point out, again, like everything, these get, these get kinda repetitive but uh, I want to point out a few things in my uh, stuff here. So the get record, we, it, we, our get method we had two, right? So we had two methods of retrieving data. We have get a single record by this reference string and then query my endpoint for anything based upon all these different query parameters. So we're gonna do the same thing in our commandlet but do the parameter uh, method. So we're gonna do two parameter sets. One is going to be by ref, and then one called by query, which you can call whatever you want, but that's the idea is we're gonna make a, because we, we only want to call one method or the other depending upon what the user's looking for, and that's where parameter sets come in. So we've got a, a parameter set that allows us to pass in our reference string, and we got that down here, our underscore ref, and then everything else is this by query. So these are all the properties we could potentially query by. Notice none of those are mandatory because we don't have to query by anything. We, we, we run, the, we run a, a git without any query strings or any query filters. We just get everything back. Uh, you'll see I've got in here at the top um, grid master and credential, and that's part of building that web session. Uh, so this is where I've put that. Rather than put it in the class, I put it in the commandlet. Um, the idea here is, yes? <laughs> that was a, um, that's some old code that IntelliSense would not leave me alone unless I had both of those in there at some point. I think they fixed that, but I just haven't fixed the code. That's all that is, so. I got red curly braces was driving me nuts, so I just kept adding stuff and, and clicking the light bulb until it shut up, <laughs> and this is what I ended up with. So it works, I don't know what it's doing, but uh, yeah. So, so what I'm doing here is, is, is allowing for a new web session, right? So you pass in your credential, you pass in the grid master that you wanna connect to, uh, the way, I've, the, way I've, the way I've set it up, and this is all purely design choice, right? I didn't want to type, I started out typing that every time. Every command I would run, I would add in credential and grid master. Tab complete is your friend, but that got to be not good enough. So what I've done is, if a web session, and this is why I script scoped this stuff. So if a web session already exists in the script scope, I will just use it, and that's why these are, these are optional. If, uh, if there is not a web session or I pass in a grid master and a credential, it will create a new web session in the script scope so the next command I run, I can leave those off. And that's, uh, that's, been, that's been super helpful. I'll show you a little bit of that. Um, but again, the, the authentication stuff is just 
weird. It's, it's kind of separate from the class stuff. It's important, but you've got to, you know, a lot of it is design choice and how you want to handle that. So um, again, so we've got all our pile of parameters. And again, we're doing, um, well, our pipeline, pipelines for our reference string, because you have a pile of those you're trying to, trying to query. And so this, my begin block, this is the web session stuff. It's in all of these, but I'm gonna only walk through it once. Um, but here's the idea is if I have a script scoped, or if I don't have a script scoped session, um, and I do have a the grid master and credential parameters, I will create that web session. If I have nothing, then I'm gonna bomb out and say you gotta log in first. Um, anyway, so that was how I chose to handle that, so I only have to type that once. Or optionally, create that web session before I start doing anything manually with this new ID web session, um, which is an option, right? You can authenticate ahead of time and then run your commands. So I kind of merged all that in a one big user-friendly thing, which part of that thing, else, that separation of code is because this is the user-facing stuff, I'm free to uh, add those kind of elements, which is the place for that kind of stuff in, in, my, in my thinking here. So uh, not a ton of stuff, but that's just kind of a general bit of code. Uh, so if we look at our process here, right, it's really not much to it. I've got two parameter sets for my two methods, and if it's one parameter set, I call that that method, and if it's the other parameter set, I call the other method. All the uh, API stuff and all my return objects is all handled by the classes, and that's it. I could, you know, I could catch the return and I could do some stuff with it, but it's already the kind of object I want to output anyway. So super short, super simple, which has kind of been my theme for all of this, right? Keep everything nice and simple. I like simple code. It fits all, mostly, almost fits on one screen, which is kind of my criteria for writing scripts. But the, the, the thing here is if you want to get complicated, if you want to add more complexity, more robustness to it, you're not starting with 200 lines of code that you're then trying to add functionality to. So um, I mentioned earlier, you know, if you dealt with APIs, everything likes to return, they love to return error 400 when anything isn't just right. So in the case of a, a DNSA record, if you're trying to get a or query for a record in a zone that doesn't exist, you won't get that message, you'll get an error 400. If you're trying to query for, and in my case, if I try to query for too many records and it's past what the API allows, it doesn't tell me that I've asked for too much, it gives me an error 400. So because I've got such a, a simple script here, what I could potentially do is add, um, add more code ahead of time, maybe, maybe check for the zone. If I define a IBDNS zone class, I can do a get on that zone property ahead of time and check that it exists. And if it doesn't exist, I can give much better feedback to the user uh, about that. So, and, and then maybe not even query for the A record. So, but this is the place for that sort of stuff. This is where you could expand upon all that user facing, uh, user facing stuff. So that's, that's super simple. Um, let's see, what did I put next? I think I put remove next because that looked pretty cool. So yeah, remove. This is, uh, this is where we get into some of the parameter stuff that I talked about in the beginning. and it, it makes it super simple, almost too simple. It kind of feels like cheating. So if we look at that, and you see I've got my uh, support should process, like every good delete method should probably have a double check. Um, so here's what we're looking at. And this line here, these are, this is really the, the key right here. It's a mandatory value, and I simply say input a record that is of type DNSA record lit collection, because right, I, I want to allow for that uh, the multiple values to come in. And the, the, the main bit of this work is handled by that. I don't really need to do any parameter validation on that because I know the properties that are in that object. I know that it came from an API endpoint, unless somebody's really messing with me. Um, and so that, that's kind of it. Now I've got some extra parameters here because again, this is user facing and I'm trying to be a you know, kinder, gentler uh, code developer. So, Helpful user friendliness stuff. If you did pass in a reference string, right? Say somebody hands you a, a CSV full of reference string. I queried these last week and I think they're still good. Can you go and delete all these? I'm pretty sure that they're valid. So I'm like, all right, you know, instead of just saying no, go away and come back with an object, I'll go ahead and get that for you. All right, if you give me authentication information or if you already have it and you give me a reference string, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to call a, the get method with that reference string. If it gets an object, I just call recall myself with that actual object. So that's just turning an extra bit. But that's, that's the idea, right, is, is in your command lets you do all the user stuff to make things more uh, user friendly. Um, so if I did pass an object, however, 
I have my should process, a good scripter, and I simply call the delete method of my class, or of my, my input object has a delete method. Um, and I pass the parameters and that's, that's it. That's all I need to do. So I've got an entire removal uh, commandlet with, what am I at, just over 50 lines of code. So this would be a good place to put in extra validations and extra checks and, uh, you know, are you trying to delete a record? Are you trying to delete an entire zone? Or did you pass on a, you know, a list of, uh, of every record? So, but you're starting, you're starting from a, a simple point. So this is, it, it's easy to expand upon it instead of starting with this uh, big mess. So this is one of, the, one of the nice benefits is everything starts really simple. Um, go through these real quick. And just kind of cover. So set is a similar in, in kind of layout to delete or to remove, right? I'm going to uh, expect an object or, or this or a collection of this particular type of object that handles all my validation. If you give me a reference string, yeah, I'll take that and I'll go and query for you to be nice. Um, and so all I'm simply adding here is the parameters that I have chosen to change. Um, and so Interesting thing here. So what I've chosen to do, and I don't know if this is the best answer for this sort of thing, but it seems to work pretty well. I set these two uh, default values that are unlikely. <laughs> um, and then what I, what I have set in code is if these, are, if these values are changed from those unlikely default values, that tells me you want to modify that property. Uh, I started with like a PS bound parameters. Uh, the trick was though is, is for, Again, this is a design choice, but so PS bound parameters, if I don't specify comment, it'll be no. It won't be in there. But what if I wanted to set comment to no? All right, I can't pass no to com comment because it'll just be no. So I, you know, I'd have to add a whole other set of parameters and say uh, maybe a switch. Do I want to change the comment? Yes. Okay, what do you want the comment to be? And then I've got 20 parameters instead of 10. So again, a design choice. This was the option I went with. Because I need to, I need to separate between a value, a null, and unset. So I got kind of three states that I wanted to deal with, right? And so that was how I kind of chose to do that. But again, the um, where's my process block? Oh, there it is. That's weird. <laughs> okay, so um, the way this looks. Same kind of thing, if, if you give me a reference string, I'll go do a query and get that for you and be nice. Um, if you have changed any of these values, so this is where I check for that change from the unlikely value. If you have changed any of these values, I'm going to call a set. Now I chose to call a single set, and this is mostly for simplicity, a, a single set method for each value. You could change the IP address and the comment and the TTL all at once. You could. Uh, I chose to do them individually and that's just purely a design choice for simplicity, right? To make that easy. Otherwise, I'd have to say, oh, well, set the one or set the both or whatever. Um, but again, it's, so that, that's kind of it. it. It does that set. Uh, I added the, the pass through, and this is the place for that because remember the set, the way I wrote the class set does not output anything. It just does a set, and then it goes on about its day. So I've added the pass through switch so it will return the input object as it's been modified, if that's something you want. And that's the place for that kind of thing, right, is in the, in the commandlet. Um, so. Yeah, we're doing on time here. Should be good. Uh, let's see. I think I had the create method, which isn't terribly exciting. Blow through that real quick. So, and then we'll run some of these. Um, create method is similar to get. All right, you're just passing in optional authentication information, name, IP address, all that. Um, is that create? Um, and same thing, it's, it's, you simply pass in the parameters and then it runs the method. And there's no, I didn't write any extra, extra, extra validation, but if, again, if you were going to add extra checks, right, if you're going to create a record into a zone that doesn't exist, you're going to want to check for that zone first, probably. And do error handling and all that fun stuff. And this would be the place to do that because it it's, starts really basic, which is kind of, I wanted to lay out this scaffolding of a super simple example and show how, how basic this can be and how, how easy the code can be. So. So those are the four commandlets. Um, oh, and I was going to mention, you know, I chose to, again, for simplicity, to do a single commandlet for a single operation on a single object, which is why I have four commandlets for one class. You could do, um, if you had multiple classes, you could do a, one big complicated commandlet for all your gets, and then do dynamic parameters to decide how your inputs are going to be, and that's a big nightmare. But again, that's, 
the, the thing with the code separation is once you've written your classes and you've defined that mapping um, to the API, how you call those classes is, is completely independent of that. You can have four commandlets, you could have one commandlet, you could have whatever. You can reference those from other commandlets, right? If I were gonna call the zone class from my A record commandlet, I can do that because I've got those sort of elements defined and I'm not, if I change how I wanna do this, I'm not rewriting everything. So, and, you know, and you get that functionality with helper functions or something like that, but the idea of having things distinctly separated uh, helps for, you know, for code development, so. So let's switch back over to our demo. Any questions, by the way? I know I'm kind of rattling through this kind of stuff. Might be too fast. If I'm, if I'm going too fast or uh, mumbling or whatever, just throw something at me in your holler. Um, but I've got a lot of stuff to kind of go through. Oh, we're supposed to hide that. You're not supposed to see that yet. Okay, commandlets. So, where's my thing? There we go. So we'll, let's look at what our end, end result is, right? We've, we've defined our classes and we've done all that work for our endpoint. And we've written our commandlets to be a better interface. And so we're gonna expect commandlets to behave like commandlets, right? So I'm gonna do a query. Just open this up a little bit now. In this case, I did a query for name server one. I actually have, this is on my, I pre-staged this like, like a cooking show. I pulled something out of the oven that's already been cooking. I've got a, uh, two records here, right? I've got two records for server one. They've got different IP addresses and different comments. But it's two records, so if I looked at, uh, if I saved this to a variable, and you know, it would just be, a, be that array of, array of objects, just like any other command line when you output. I could uh, pipe that to, uh, actually, let's do that, right? If I did uh, pipe it to a table, you get a table view, right? So all the stuff you expect from objects, that, that all works the same. Um, so let's do an additional query where we can query from multiple values simultaneously. So we're gonna get server one, the other one, not both. So that's, uh, that's that one record and that returns. And again, behind the scenes, this is still that collection of records because of the method that we chose. It's got only one element in it, um, but the users don't care about that. I get an output, you know, I could, uh, I could pipe that to uh, FT just as well or output CSV or whatever. Um, and that's cool. So let's create a new record right quick just so we can mess around with that. And that works exactly, again, exactly how you would expect that to. I got my should process. So I get uh, kudos for writing good code. You should always have one of these, by the way, uh, if you're writing commandlets that do anything. And there we go. It creates a record and outputs it and just looks like everything else. It's an, it's an object of that type. Um, so that's fun. Let's, let's, let's cause some damage. Let's do some pipelines. So I'm gonna do my get DNSA record to server one, which remember there are two of them. And I'm gonna take each one of those, pass it across the pipeline. This is like any other commandlet that, that you would write, right? Um, but this is, this is kind of what this looks like, right? So I get a should process on the first record. Not on the whole thing, just on the first record. And I've got, you see I've got my, uh, on my target and it gives me the two string representation of the record instead of just, do you wanna do a remove on DNSA record? That would be less useful. But here I've got the actual object, so that's much more useful. Uh, for a lot of, lot of use cases, so I'm gonna say yes to that, and then I get my next one. Passes across the pipeline, just like you would expect any array pipeline operations to do. And that's it, so uh, that's all kind of standard stuff. Same with, uh, with set here, right? Let me run this. Nope, I don't wanna move that down. There we go, so if I run this, right, I get that server two record, right? And it's got a comment of second record. Very unique and useful. If you saw that in production, you'd be very happy that comment was there. So I'm gonna change that comment to something that's arguably not much better. So same thing, I'm gonna pipe, pipe just like remove, pipe it to DNSA record. The only thing I have to specify is the comment I wanna change it to. Everything else comes across the pipeline in my piped object. I get my should process. And now if I look at my object, I have, I have my updated comment. Um, so that all works exactly how it, you would expect commandlets to work um, with not a lot of extra work um, and in, a, in, 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 in my opinion, much, a much cleaner sort of structured way of, of putting your code together. It's readable, it's understandable. Anytime you could put a script on one screen and not have to scroll through a million. Of course, I could, should probably add more comments and verbose logging and all that kind of stuff that would make it a little bit bigger, but it starts out very simple. Um, we're good on time there. So any questions about any of that stuff before I flip to the other half? No, okay. You're all either asleep or uh, 
Interested, one of the two. Okay. Turn the clock, yeah, we're good. So, so that's great, and you're gonna do this, and in, in my case, I've got at this point, with my one object, I've got a single class definition and four commandlets. If you're like me and you like to s separate all your scripts out into individual files for ease of coding, is what you see, you've got something like this. Um, and then you're going to add, to kind of do a rinse and repeat operation, you're gonna go hit the CNAME record next. And you're gonna do the same kind of thing with changing properties around for CNAMEs are obviously a little bit different. And then you're gonna hit PTR, and then you're gonna do a fixed address, and then you're gonna do, um, you know, whatever IPAM or DHCP leases. There's no shortage of objects on, your, uh, on, your, on a typical API. So when you're done with that, you're gonna have a folder full of stuff. And again, what we talked about is this is, uh, that's, that's great, but what we want to do is make that useful for everyone. So let's talk about now how we're gonna go from a folder full of scripts and class definitions, PS1s, to ultimately a module published on the PS gallery that anyone can download, import, use, update. Let's get back and do some PowerPoint because that's what we're all here for. <laughs> See if I can do my fat magic hotkeys here, all right. No, maybe, there we go, okay, that's where we left off. So let's talk about the release pipeline. <laughs> um, that's my son enjoying his own release pipeline. Uh, <laughs> so release pipeline, there's nothing better than just sitting back and watching a release pipeline just go. It's just, uh, anyway, enough of that. <laughs> it's not recorded, you can cut that out. Okay, so release pipeline, you hear people talk about it. Build, test, deploy, or, or, or source, build, test, deploy, right? So, so we're looking at that, we wanna do that, and of course we wanna automate everything, right? So let's look at what that might mean in our case, right? So build. My thinking on build is, is let's, at the end of a build, let's create something, let's create a tangible thing that I can, I can interact with, right? So I'm thinking I'm gonna make a module, right? So I'm gonna create my directory structure. Um, and next one's kinda contentious. I like to concatenate all my script files into one big PSM1. I know people like to dot source. That's cool too, if that's, how, you know, if that's what you wanna do. Um, I don't know if one's better than the other. People like to argue about that on the internet because it's the internet. Um, I might make some change or create or make some changes to my module manifest. Uh, if I'm gonna go to the gallery, I'm gonna need to have all my uh, metadata for that. Versioning information it would go in there. If I'm using uh, external help, if I'm using Markdown, I'm gonna turn those into that horrible, worse XML, worse than XML mammal thing. Um, and I'm gonna use platypus because I don't wanna do that by hand. So if I'm using inline help, that wouldn't be something I would need to do, but those are the steps I would define and, and at the end of my build, however I've chosen to do it, I have a module in a folder that I could take and copy and give to someone and they can import and it works just like any module would. So that's my build. Um, deploy is, well, deploy is pretty simple, right? I wanna deploy it to the gallery and since I've done all my work in build, that's, that's actually relatively trivial. But between those two things, because again, I wanna automate this and I don't wanna deploy a bad change, I'm gonna do some, uh, I'm gonna do a test. All right, so I'm thinking, okay, I'll fire up Pester and do some tests and then because I wanna do these in an isolated fashion, thinking, okay, well, everything is local until invoke rest method. And invoke rest method is where I leave and I go out to my endpoint and do stuff. Well, and I'm not going to assume I have an endpoint. Um, it occurred to me that running a bunch of zone and record deletions and creations on my uh, corporate DNS appliance would probably be a bad thing. So I thought I should mock that and save my job. So that's where I, I started. I'll just mock invoke rest method. Catch whatever comes from my, my, when my class calls invoke rest method, my URI string and my payload. Figure out what I need to, if that worked and then return an appropriate output that my code was expecting and then do sort of an end to end test. The problem with that is what you're really saying there, the short version of what I just said was, I'll just reverse engineer my API. How hard could that be? Impossible, it turns out, unless you have access to the source code. So I actually went down that route and write a bunch of code and I'm parsing URIs and if it's a git method, I look for this syntax. And if it's a post, I'm looking for this syntax and doing my hash table and all this kind of stuff. And I got this big block and I thought to myself, you know, it's, it's, it's probably a, a, the first law of unit testing that if your test code is more complex than the code you're testing, then it's not good test code. And that was where I was at. And it turned out it didn't work anyway because once I went actually to an actual appliance, I guessed wrong on my reverse engineering and it didn't work anyway. So 
So that's generally a bad idea. Um, if you want to break this down and, and do more inputs and outputs before and after invoke rest method and do true unit tests, you could probably do something like that. But what I wanted was my end to end test because I've got to run this against an endpoint anyway. Um, so, so mocking didn't work. So if you can't beat them, join them. And I sat in a dark corner and cried for a little while and rocked back and forth and threw away all my PowerShell books, all my t-shirts. And then I thought to myself, what, is, what does everyone do when they have a problem they can't solve? Where is, where did I read in CEO magazine that all problems are solved? The cloud will solve all our problems, right? Microsoft tells us that every year. <laughs> so, so I went to the cloud. Um, and it actually worked in this case, so yeah. <laughs> um, so what that means in this case is what I'm gonna do in the cloud is build a endpoint, a new endpoint, a fresh endpoint, my endpoint, for my, in my case, my appliance. I'm gonna build a brand new one, run all my tests against it, because it's, it's, it's empty, I've, or, or I set it up the way I want it. It's, it's mine, it's real, it's live, and I, I control all the variables for that. So, so that, that was kind of the idea. And, and there's two things you need when you want to do that. I'm gonna walk through kind of the, the overview of that here. You need, because again, we're, we're doing this in a programmatic fashion, we do this automatically. I'm not gonna be manually building anything in the portal. Uh, so we need an ARM template. Um, I'm also not gonna be manually logging into the portal to run said ARM template, or doing any interactive login for PowerShell at all. Um, so we need some non-interactive authentication information. Um, so that is kind of the, that's the goal, right? And we're gonna integrate that into our release pipeline into our build, test, deploy. So, so this is kind of what we end up with. Uh, you'll see I've got our build and our test deploy, right? These are our, our kind of our, our dependent code blocks. And then I'm gonna stick build test environment right before test. Uh, and I've added some extra stuff. Clean is just some housekeeping. Um, init is gonna be our login. We're gonna do our login there. Because really, if, if the login doesn't work, there's no sense in doing any of the other stuff, right? If we can't, run our, if we can't create our tests, there's no point in, in doing a build. So um, I'm gonna run all this from AppVair was my choice. Um, and so what you end up with with AppVair, and we'll, I'll walk through these a little bit. Uh, AppVair uses a YAML file to give it instructions. You tell it what to do, and you tell it uh, you know, what to run, and set some variables, and, and all that. And that just calls it AppVair PS1 script, and then that calls your, your Saki. Uh, Saki is a, a DSL that allows you to kind of define dependent code blocks in a nice readable fashion. Um, by the way, if, if, if this model looks familiar at all, this is a, uh, this is all from Warren Frame's blog a few years back on PS Deploy and Release Pipelines for PowerShell. I totally stole a lot of his code um, and, then, and then added some stuff to it. So if you see him, thank him. If you read that blog, I actually got, at the end, I've got a link to it. Um, that was a really good way to kind of see an end-to-end -end process and get an idea of how a release pipeline should work. So if you're not already super familiar with release pipelines and all the steps, that was a great, that was a great thing. So I took that and, and added some stuff to it, right? That's, that's what we do here is take someone else's stuff and add on to it. Um, so that's AppVair. Um, you could do the same kind of thing with Jenkins or with uh, Squid or what, uh, Octopus or whatever, um, or potentially locally, right? Maybe I'm doing uh, local development on a new feature. Maybe I'm adding the CNAME record. And before I go production and maybe accidentally deploy an unfinished thing to the gallery, I want to run, uh, run some, some local tests. So maybe I'll add uh, uh, the, the, uh, well, the well-named build.ps1, and that's just going to be a local script that will allow me to call the exact same production script. So I'm going to run the same build. I'm going to run the same tests, um, which is handy when I'm doing development on a new feature on this other branch. I'm not going to accidentally deploy it. You put some checks in there, but... Maybe I want to make sure that, okay, if it passes all these tests locally on my PC, it's still going out to the same endpoint. There's, a, there's no reason why it shouldn't work when AppFair uh, runs it. So that's kind of the idea. So let's take a look at what that looks like. And again, this is all, this is the optional part of the presentation because you can really do this however you want it. You can have eight steps or two steps or 15 or whatever. You can branch off and come back and do, uh, Saki allows you to do all kinds of really complex. But again, my theme is simplicity. So I'm just gonna go in a simple sort of fashion through all of this stuff here. So let me switch over to that. That is over here. Um, oh wait, no, so before I, before I do that, that's right, I was going to talk about Azure a little bit. I promise this isn't a pitch. I hate the, uh, the cloud pitches, but in this case it works. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through 
Uh, if you're cloud averse, like I like I was, um, it's handy to see this. So, so we need um, two things. Oh, that's the next thing we're going to. I mentioned we need we need two things when we're dealing with Azure in an automated fashion. We need an ARM template, and then we need some sort of login information. So, I'm not going to talk about ARM templates because I totally cheated. I went out to the portal, click click click, built my endpoint, um, which in my case it turned out to just to be a uh, a VM with a custom image that this, this vendor created. Um, it, it can be as complicated as your API dictates, right? It has to be some sort of weird cluster with this web front end. And you know, if you have to define all that, you go out there and you build all that. I, told, I built all that from hand, put it, gave it a public IP address so I could access it, verified that it worked, and then I just just did a snapshot. There's a, a it's changed since I did it, but they 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 make it super easy. Actually, let me just show you that here. They make it super easy to grab that ARM template. The ARM template that they write. Oh, this thing's getting in the way here. There we go. So this is my test bed for this session. So in my case, I've just got, this is just a pile of all my resources. I've got my virtual machine, and then of course that has a network adapter and a storage account and a public IP address. That's obviously important, so I can get to it. So I just come up, once I get that and I verify, manually verify that that's all working and accessible from, from anywhere, I can just come over to my automation script, this tab they added, um, and it writes it writes the ARM template for me. Uh, it's not the prettiest code in the world, and you'll probably want to do some cleanup, but once you get it working, you don't really have to muck with that any, uh, ideally, All right? Um, so that's that's you know the the world's shortest ARM template demo, but uh, you can you can dig more into that. Um, I think there's some there's some sessions on ARM templates that go into a whole lot more detail on that. Um, what I, I want to talk about in Azure is the second half, the authentication piece, because that's kind of weird. So what I'm basically saying is I want to allow an application to authenticate automatically like a user. And in the old days of AD, we would call that like a service principle. I want to authenticate as an application. You kind of have that here. So what we're going to do, um, we're going to go to our Azure Active Directory. Um, and you don't need a complicated, fancy, corporate P2, whatever. See, I'm using my on Microsoft, which is the free one they gave me when I logged in, and it's, you know, it's a free trial. Um, oh, what did I click on? Oh, I went back, okay. Mouse. So I'm gonna come in here and what they call app registrations. I'm going to create a new web app um, to do my login. And this, is, uh, this gets in all kinds of weird uh, OAuth and, and application. We're not gonna really do any of that. We're just creating an application so we have a security context on which to authenticate. Um, Let's come in here, new application registration. And you, again, the, the, what we feel in here matters very little. Um, uh, you want to give it something that uh, you can find later. And I've done this a few times. So we'll call this Infowalk DNS Appliance REST Test, something unique. Uh, sign on URL, again, because this isn't a real web app that we're authenticating to, or our, our, our test call is calling it, but we're not authenticating it. Sign on URL doesn't really matter. You can put whatever. You can put localhost. Uh, I like to put the, uh, my GitHub repo for the project, just to kind of help me remember what I was doing when I see this later. Uh, I don't even think that's right, but uh, anyway, it doesn't really matter. It just has to be a URL, because again, we're not going to use that. What we are going to use, well, we got to go find it. It's too much to ask for them to give it to us. So we're going to search for it. Nope, that's not my app, apparently. It's someone else's. So and you can see I've done this. I've done this a few times. i got some mess. What did I call it? This one here. So what we are going to use is this application ID. That is going to be our, uh, effectively be our username for our credential object, application ID. So we're going to copy that off. And you just throw that in a notepad or whatever for, for later use. We'll save that. Um, now we need a password. We've got a username, we need a password. So we're going to come in here to settings, go to keys. I promise the GUI part's almost over. Uh, so we're going, to, we're going to create a new password object. Just call it whatever. We'll call it password because we're super creative. Uh, duration of how long you want it to last. We'll just say never. And then uh, value will be displayed on save. So we're not going to specify the password. We're going to let Azure pick it. So we're going to save this. And it's going to give us this password. Uh, notice it says you won't be able to retrieve this later, so you'll want to memorize that immediately. Um, or I guess we could, you know, for demo's sake, we'll just copy it out. But I would totally memorize that if I wasn't doing a presentation. 
So you're going to save that off. Let me memorize it. Um, so now we've got our username and password. And we can stick that out in app there. We can stick that in wherever. Of course, it's a username and password, so we're going to talk about how to obfuscate that. We don't want to put that in, in our source control. That's out on GitHub. Our uh, Azure login on GitHub is probably a bad idea. So, all right, so that's enough of the uh, fancy web interface. And that's great. But anything, just about anything you can do through the Azure portal, you can do through PowerShell. So let's do it through PowerShell because that's way more fun. Um, so I've already done the interactive login here. I think, unless it timed out on me, we'll find out. Uh, so when you do these, we're going to do the same thing. We're just going to create an application registration, username and password. Uh, in this case, rather than have the portal create a password for us, we're going to specify it. So we're going to make a nice long password with a special character in uppercase, create a secure string from it, and we're going to call this new Azure RM AD application. And same kind of stuff that we filled in, right? We give it a, a display name, uh, we give it a URL, and in this case, we give it the password rather than asking us to uh, specify it. But we're going to run that. Let's see if that, I'm still logged in. Oh, that's right. I keep doing this over and over again. Let's change this a little bit. Again, the name doesn't matter. Oh, why I didn't clean that up. i got to change this, too. It's a problem with demos. They make a lot of garbage. There we go. So now we've got an application. And we can look at it, and it's just you know an object with some stuff in it. Um, so that is the PowerShell version of all the pointy clicky stuff that we did, and this is, this is better. So, but they amount to the same thing. You've now got a, uh, you have um, a URL, uh, uh, an application ID, and it's got a password. So you've got the makings of a credential object. So let's go through and let's do the next part, which would be to how you would actually use that to log into Azure. So we could use the, uh, the information that we uh, memorized, I mean wrote down. Um, but we're not, we're just, we've already got it in PowerShell here, so we're just going to use that, right? So we're going to create your standard PS credential object, right? No big deal. We're using the application ID, not GUID, and the, the secure password. Because our application ID is our username, so we're going to create that. And when you do this here, you've got to, you have to get the uh, tenant ID. Uh, and there's a couple different ways of getting that, or you can write it down. I heard there's actually a website called, like, what is my tenant ID? And you give it a URL, and it'll tell you, this is your tenant ID, or this is their tenant ID, or whoever. So that's kind of cool. Uh, we're going to use this Git Azure RM subscription, um, and that's just a you know just a way of getting that. We just need that to tell it where we're logging into, and then we're going to use uh, login Azure RM account. Um, we're telling it we're giving that credential object and the tenant ID. We're telling it this is a service principal login, so it doesn't try to do any interactive nonsense, um, and that is just it's a trivial thing. It, it runs back and then it logs in. It spits us back our information saying we're logged in. So this is the the bit of code that we put in our our build pipeline. Um, we, we obfuscate our, our, our password, obviously. But this is the code. This is completely non-interactive. So I use the AppVair uh, encryption. Yeah. Secure string, yeah. I just go in. And I, if we have time, I'll, I'll show you that. But yeah, it's, that's super simple. So yeah, I just use that. Um, when I'm doing the, the local build script that's not AppVair, I just build all those passwords ahead of time and then pipe them in through parameters. Yeah. Uh, let's see, where was I on that? Yeah, so, so I'm going to walk through um, what this kind of looks like, just to kind of give you a look at, at, at how that looks. So uh, start with AppVair. So this is the AppVair YAML file. If you haven't seen this, oh, let me expand all my stuff here. Yeah, well, let me expand it all. So. The YAML file is just a basic instruction set for AppVair to kick off. When you, when you create an AppVair account, you tie it to your GitHub account. And so I'm giving you a couple things here. I'm telling it uh, if, I have a skip, if I have a commit message that says updated readme, don't do a build. I don't need you to do anything. Just go back to sleep. I'm, I'm only doing um, a build on the master branch. So I can do commits to any other branch without worrying about it kicking off a deploy. Um, and then the rest of that mostly is, is environment variables. That's kind of its method of, of passing information along to the build server, because this is all running on their build server, which is just a PowerShell session out on their server. Um, so I've got my module name and my resource group, and that's used when I'm developing, you know, spinning up my Azure environment. Um, I've got an admin password, which of course I want to obfuscate. So this is what that looks like. You get this secure string, um, and, and AppVair, AppVair provides that. It encrypts it with your, your account, so it can always decrypt it. And it does a pretty cool thing when you use this secure password string method. 
when it runs its build system, and if it, if it, if it uses that password in any sort of visible way, it keeps track of that and it'll obfuscate so you get a bunch of stars on the output screen. Unless you do like write out host, write host password or something stupid. But it'll protect its, it keeps itself from screwing up and then, you know, lets you kind of do your own thing. But it's, it takes a little effort. So, you know, and I've got all kinds of stuff encrypted. Uh, I encrypted my tenant ID just for fun and my app login. is one I already made, obviously. Uh, my PS gallery key, of course, is important. You don't want anyone deploying as you. So we just add all those in there. But again, you got unencrypted variables, encrypted variables. They're treated the same way. Uh, dollar E and V colon, these all show up as environment variables when you're running, when you're running your scripts. You just treat them like environment variables. Um, and then I'm telling it to just run this test script, right? You can do a build script and a test script and you can let AppVare handle those stages. Um, I'm just calling one script and letting Saki handle all my ordering of my steps. Um, you can do that kind of however you want. Um, so that's gonna call AppVare PS1 and all I'm kind of really doing here is setting some variables to other variables. Um, the reason I'm doing that is uh, I don't want to be everything to be, I don't want my Saki script to be tied directly to AppVare, right? Because again, I might use Jenkins or something or my local build script. So this is kind of a shim script because I don't want to use, I don't want to reference AppVare build folder in Saki because I can't use AppVare build folder if I'm not using AppVare. So I have project root and artifact root and uh, module version. Um, I import some modules that Saki might need to run. Obviously, I need Saki installed to run Saki and Pester and Platypus. So I just install some modules because again, at, at the end of the day, a build system is just a, a PowerShell environment spun up that you're running scripts against. And that's, that's really all a build system is. So I'm gonna call invoke Saki and give it my script. It's going to walk through that. This is what AppVayer is running. And the way this is laid out, oh, that didn't minimize. I was gonna do a whole big pretty thing here. Let's see. I didn't do it, hold on a second. I got this new uh, extension called Fold. It's really cool for auto folding stuff, except when it isn't, apparently. So. And I wanted to, uh, to kind of have this view because I want to show the layout. So domain-specific language, it uses this concept of a task, right? So they do a sort of an inverse thing. Default always runs. And I say default depends on deploy and clean test environment, which is my last one. Of course, deploy depends upon test. So it's going to run test first. And then test depends on build, et cetera. So it runs in a top-down fashion from a bottom-up dependency. Kind of weird. Um, but that's, that's kind of the idea of, 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 uh, of Saki, and you can do branches and you can do all kinds of extra dependencies. I didn't need anything too complex, and for a basic uh, PowerShell module function, you don't need anything too complex. Um, so let's see, so init, I, I mentioned I do um, my login there. Oh no, that's my, I gotta use my hotkey here. Uh, so I check if my build system is AppVayer. Um, in my case, I'm doing AppVayer and local. So if I'm doing a local build, I'm just gonna use an interactive login. So if my build system is at there, I'm going to do my non-interactive login that we just saw with our credentials. And I'm, notice I'm referencing Azure app login ID as an environment variable that was encrypted, but through at there, I don't need to do anything special to tell it to decrypt it, it just handles that. Same with my password, it just handles that. Um, and then this is what we just saw. We log in with a service principal login. Um, I do that first, because I don't wanna bother doing Anything else, if that fails, it's just, it's, it's all gonna go south from there. Um, clean is just some, uh, when I'm running iterations with a local build, you know, you gotta delete some folders. Uh, so let's look at build is, is that's what I was talking about with, I wanna build an, a module. So this is all my code to turn a pile of PS1s into a usable module. Um, a couple things in here, that, one that's really been useful is the versioning. So app there, will give you a build number, and that's, a, that's an exposed variable, uh, environment, underscore, build, build, build number, something like that. And that, that will uh, increment every time a build runs. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use that build number in my uh, module manifest as the version number. Just automatically increment. So that way, every time I do a deploy to the gallery, it goes up by one. If I wanna change my major minor version manually, if I'm like, oh, this is so much better than the last one, I'll make it 1.2, you know, I can do that. But, this helps me not worry about unincrementing or having you know versions step on versions. That's all just automatic. So that 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 pretty works. If I ever get to whatever they, whenever that number rolls, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if that rolls at 99 or 999. I don't know. But uh, I'm only at like 50, so that should last me for a pretty good while. Um, and so that's one of the things I'm going to do with my 
update module manifest is I'm going to take, I've got a, a static module manifest that has a, everything you need to run that module. It's pretty much, most of that information is static, right? I update the copyright because I kind of feel like I should, I don't know. Um, and then I, I, mef, I have some variables there. The module version is really the only thing I'm changing here is I'm going to increment that based on my build number. So that when I deploy it again, it, it's going to show up as new. Which PowerShell Gallery likes that sort of thing, and PSGit likes that sort of thing. And this is where I'm going to do my, my platypus, right? So I create my new external help. If, if you're doing you know, external help or markdown help, that's important. Have that. So that's all kind of done, and when that's, if that works, because um, Sake looks at, looks at errors. If any of these bomb out or throw an error, the whole thing will stop. It, it, it depend, the dependency is sort of depends upon build, but really depends upon build not failing is what it's what it's actually saying in the shorthand. So next I'm going to build my test environment, and that is my Azure deploy, basically. So I've already done my login, which presumably if I've gotten to this point, that passed. Um, so build test environment is, is two things, really. I'm creating a new resource group based on, a, on an environment variable I set with a location that I set there. And then I run through. Um, there's this command, it, it doesn't do a whole lot, test Azure RM resource group deployment. Oh, those names, jeez. Um, that's gonna do some basic validation on your ARM template, gives you a reasonable chance that it might work. So errors still get through, um, but that's something worth running. So again, I'm checking that that passes, and then I'm gonna run my deployment. Now, I've got, I have this, um, that ARM template that I downloaded that I let the portal write, which is just a big steaming mess. Everything's a parameter, it's like 800 parameters, and they're all static values anyway, it's, it's, it's ugly, but it works. So you can clean that up if you want or not, or just close your eyes and pretend it's not too bad. Um, so I'm gonna pass the resource group, obviously, to put it in. Uh, there's my template file, my Azure Deploy JSON, and I just save that in my, my source control there. Um, there are any numbers of, number of parameters I could pass to it. The only thing that I want to pass to it, really, because nothing really changes, but I do wanna pass my password to it, because again, I don't wanna put a password in my ARM template any more than I want to put a password in my, the rest of my code. So I'm going to pass that, um, that password and I'm going to let AppVair decrypt that admin password. And that's going to happen all kind of behind the scenes. So that's going to deploy my Azure environment and that takes about eight minutes. So that's not bad. It's going to look for that status, that provisioning state. So if that succeeded, it's then going to continue on. If that fails, of course it's going to stop because there's no reason to run tests against an environment that doesn't exist. Um, my tests are, are just your standard pester tests. And so that's just going to uh, gather some data and run Invoke Pester. And, and the way I've organized the test, I won't go into that because we don't have three hours. I wrote a lot of tests. It's kind of embarrassing. But the, the, the idea there, because I've, I now have an in, an, a, a full environment, I can do full tests. I, just, I don't need to test this piece or this piece. I can just say, create a new DNSA record with the name of server one. Get the DNSA record. Is the name server one? Okay, good. Is, is the IP address what I said it should be? Good, okay. Now take server one and delete it. Did it delete? Yes. So I test the creation and then I can test the deletion and I can, in between that I can test all the querying. Now there's two server ones with an IP address of whatever. Um, and again, I don't have to do anything really complicated because I just have an environment to run against. I, I'm not really doing weird unit tests. I just run, run, run the full thing. Uh, okay, and so that's that, and then deploy is really hard, is, is, is pretty straightforward. Once, if we've actually made it this far, publish module. That's really it, right? I've got my module name, um, it's, it's, it's in my, my environment, and then my API key is my encrypted string that I let out there encrypt for me. That's really all it is. And then because I'm a cheapskate, I added clean test environment, and that's going to go back to Azure, like two minutes later after my tests are run, and delete everything. Well, delete everything in that resource group, not everything else. God. Um, so, and that's really cool. Um, not to get all weird and evangelize-y, but basically what I've done there is created an environment automatically, run uh, 400 tests or some ungodly amount of tests against it in like three minutes, and then delete it. And so what I pay for is that three minutes of runtime, which they usually round down to nothing, so, which is nice. Um, yeah, so that's kind of that. How are we doing on time? I started this late. What, when is this in? 12.45? Okay, so yeah, we're about on track. So any questions on any of that stuff? Yeah, now a lot of this is, is, is up to you how you want to do it, and it's very much up to design choices, but I, I kind of wanted to point out, you know, kind of walk through um, 
an end-to-end -end thing. It was just seeing, seeing that from start to finish. Is, for, me, anyway, for me, it was really helpful um, to see that. I, I didn't really get the individual pieces until I kind of saw how it all walked through. So let me show you. Sorry, yes. Yes, I was actually going to show you that next. Yeah, that's, we got a few minutes. So let's show you AppVair. And AppVair is super simple. It's almost uh, disappointingly so. But uh, so log in to AppVair. Um, I've logged in. You can link it with a number of different accounts. I've linked it to my GitHub account. That seemed to make it sense. So, so this is me logged in to AppVair. And I'm looking at, in this case, I'm looking at my latest build. Uh, let me show you this here first here. Right? So this is a history of all the builds that have been run. And you see over here, it's got, it has the, uh, where, the build number. So it's, it's, it's pulled in that 1.1 and the 1.2 is for me. I put that in my module manifest. Uh, actually, I think I put it in a variable first. It came from me somewhere. And I had that, and so I control the incrementing of those codes. But then you see AppVair is doing 60, 61, 62, 63. So I'm just grabbing that. It's handling that incrementation. Um, the message here is just whatever my commit message happened to be for that master branch. So you can see here, uh, I added uh, an IB lease object to handle DHCP leases and define them as a class, so then I incremented that. So if we look at one of those here, we'll look at this latest one here. Again, because all a build system is, is just someone else's PowerShell session running your scripts for you. Um, and so what it does, the first thing it does is it, any build system will do this, it, it uses Git to clone the repository, so it gets a fresh copy of all the data in a local folder. And then it, you know, then it has its YAML that, uh, that, calls, that calls the PS1. Um, the output of this is really all up to you. This is probably one of those times when it's okay to use write host because you're not outputting to anything but the screen here. You're not going to pipe to anything. Uh, so, you know, I, I have these lines, right? It's just, it's just outputs lines to, to kind of separate the sections. Ideally, you'd put in some good information about kind of where it was in the process. I didn't do any of that. So <laughs> there's not a whole lot in here. So, you know, but in it, you know, I, I, would, I would do a login and I would probably say logging into Azure. Uh, Login has succeeded. Um, but this is, is Sake is kind of doing this. So Sake is telling you executing the init task that is defined in that, that block. Executing clean, executing build. So there's some output I just didn't catch. Again, this is just sort of, uh, oh, go away a little, there you go. Um, so th but this is, again, if you, were, if you were running Sake locally, this is what you would see. Just like on the, on the build system, this is what you see. Uh, it's just a PowerShell session. So you can see um, not, all, not a whole lot of output when I run my tests. Here's where you see all my pester tests. Um, so you could, I guess I could talk about these real quick. So if you break, I've broken these up into sections, right? So for each uh, object I've created, like in this case, I've got this uh, web session test and this uh, uh, IB view, this is, a, this, it's an Infoblox construct, but I've got networks and DNS zones and DNS records. And so you can see I'm doing, I've got this, the way I, I did it to save myself some typing is I do a, in order to do a remove test, I need an object. Um, and in order to do a get test, I need an object. So I'm going to run all my create tests first. I'm going to do two things with it. I'm going to create all the objects so that I can use them later. And I'm actually going to test that they were created correctly. So I do my create test for each of my records. And then I'm going to run my queries, query against all the different kinds of permutations of how to find stuff. And then at the end, I'm going to run all my, uh, my, my deletes. And I, I didn't write really fancy pester tests, so I just wrote a lot of them, because that should be the same thing, right? So, and then I wrote some more, and then I got tired, and then I wrote some more, and then I deleted some stuff, and I wrote some more, and then my test complete. And then at the end, this is all Saki here. Saki gives you this little report, and so it'll tell you how long each section took. All right, so you can see it, the build test environment, about eight minutes to deploy to Azure. My test took about just under four minutes to run. And then I, I did my clean. The deploy takes no time at all, and then clean. So, so that's uh, Saki handle, handling most of that output. Um, and then and, and, and out there, it's just sort of running that on your behalf. Uh, Jenkins and all those other ones, they probably work in a similar sort of fashion. Let me show you while we're in here. I think we've got a few minutes. Um, the encryption thing. It's, so you go to your account, because it's, it's, it's based upon your account. And you, you, know, you have all your stuff for your, your standard account stuff. That you, They'll let you give them money if you want to, but you don't have to. This, this is all free, I should uh, mention that. The AppVair thing for, for a basic setup is completely free. Um, so they have this section here, encrypt data. So you go in here, and this is just encrypting it for your account. Uh, so for any project that you have, this works. So you just put in uh, whatever, a nice secure password that no one would ever use. Um, encrypt it, and it spits out that encrypted value. 
And it also shows you uh, the syntax for your YAML. So you can just copy and paste that, stick that straight in your YAML, probably change the name of the variable. You wouldn't want to have more than one of those. But um, yeah, so that's, that's really all there is. And AppVair makes that super simple. Uh, if you're going to run a local build system, obviously you wouldn't use those. That's going to be unique to AppVair. But that's where that shim script comes in, right? You're going to pull those in and then set the values to something that you expect to be, to be more modular. So uh, let's see. That, I believe, is, um, well, maybe. OK, come on. Yes, yeah, so that, oh, I like doing all that again. OK, so that's, so that's, that's I guess, the review. That's what we talked about. Um, I won't walk through the little build script. It's basically the same kind of thing as the AppVayer script. It's just setting some variables and taking more interactive input. Um, whew, and that's it. That's what I have. I am uh, exhausted and passed out on the couch. <laughs> um, I've got a couple links up here. The top one is um, the link to this presentation. That, that repository has this uh, slide deck. It has uh, the demo code and all that kind of stuff. The next one is the actual project that I based this on. So if you, if you actually have an info box and you care, check that one out. Um, it's on the in, it's on actually on the gallery as, I think I call it Infoblox Commandlets. There's a few of them out there. But if you want to check out the larger set of code, Infoblox Classy is where that's at. That last link is Warren's blog on the PS Deploy. It's a little old. I mentioned to him yesterday. I was like, hey, I loved your blog. I'm going to actually use that slide code. Kind of like, that one? So <laughs> I don't take it for what you will. But he had some links in there to some other work and kind of how this release pipeline lays out. And it was really helpful for me to kind of understand. And I based a lot of what I did off of that. So I wanted to include that link. Um, so that's it. Any, uh, any questions? Uh, we're, we're, we're finishing a little early, but yes? Which part? Uh, method, the new method you were creating. Method. I, I watched uh, some of that and I could do a method and do the function like that. And one of the questions came to mind is you were talking about how you can send rather than just one item to it, you could send a list of objects to it. For which one? I'm not sure which one you're. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah I'm not, the, that's the problem with something like this is because the classes have methods, APIs have method, invoke rest method has methods, so. It's hard to talk about because it, uh, it gets muddled real quick. But uh, anyway, um, so that's it. That's all I have, I guess. Uh, we, we, can, we can be the first ones in the lunch line, so that's cool. Thank you all very much. Please. Uh, <laughs> thank you.